but it is time for Shiny Side Out with Dave and Mecky. So I hope you have your tinfoil hat all made and cinched down tight over your ears. So take it away, Dave and Mecky. Welcome to Shiny Side Out with Dave and Mecky. Hey, Mecky, Mecky. We're on WZZR. In the U.S., it's in Kentucky, by the way, broadcasting from Australia for Revolution Radio on freedomslips.com, where it's more than just radio, so jump into the chat room if you can. This, just letting you know, is show number 275. Pause for Mecky. 570 and 200. It's on air online. (laughs) <laughs> and on your smart device, so grab an app to listen anywhere or listen at home on the Grace Tabletop Digital Radio. You can do that too. If you missed Solaris's show, and I did miss most of it, I'm really sorry, and I'm going to check it in the archives, she had uh, Dr. Renee Colston on talking about animal healing. That was really cool. However, because I missed it, I'm going to go and jump in the archives. I can jump in the archives and see any past shows that have been done by any of the hosts, and it only costs a coffee a month. $5 a month is all it costs. And I really need, I, I mean, I ask that you go in there and, and do the same thing because it's awesome. If they're replaying our show and we don't back onto Solaris you, and you don't know who we're talking about, or you're listening to this show because it's on YouTube, go to freedomslips.com. And you might like what they have to offer. If you like this, you might like what they've got. Okay, so I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Dark and Young people, and Meki. The Daruk people for me. The Daruk people, and we pay respects to the elders past, present, and future, and thank them for allowing us to use their land. Now, Meki. What a week it has been. Yes, yes, it has been a week, seven days. (laughs) It's been one of those. (laughs) Yet again, again with the weeks. Why? What's what? How come? Do you know? I think it's getting quicker. Um, I'm liking the distance between the shows now, it's getting much quicker. Well, look, that's I I can't disagree because today uh, we were just talking um, and and we said, oh, we we just went to a wedding. (coughs) Yeah. 10 years ago and i, I tell you and I, I, I was i was I, I, it did give me pause because i thought really 10 years since we've been to that wedding it, because the event is is crystal clear in my mind um now okay so my, i might have a good memory but it also didn't feel like 10 years 10 years is a long time and and i, I was i was i was taken aback a little so and, and i agree with you it, it seems that time is, is moving and, uh, the intervals between our shows are uh, you know, consequently uh, uh, shortening uh, but but hey this could be completely uh, um imaginary right as, as we will discuss today anyway <laughs> yes yes that, that's right <laughs> <laughs> you were doing something <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, i uh, know <laughs> but but there's something uh, there's something that worried me uh, uh, this week dave i want to quickly just very quickly talk about i don't want to make the show about this but it's important that we do um, there, there was a building that that uh, burned. Uh, it was pretty much gutted by fire in London, in the mm-hmm. Grenfell, Grenfell Tower. Grenfell Tower. Um, mm-hmm. Now there's there's some uh, you know there's some um, conspiracy theories around it. You know you know they wanted to uh, to burn it down to make room for luxury condos, whatever. Look, that's not what I'm going to talk about. What I want, do want to talk about is I don't know if you guys uh, if you guys have seen the blaze itself. I mean, three quarters. If, if not 80% or 90% of the building are completely destroyed by fire. I mean, gutted. All, all that's mm. left is, 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 a, is, a, is a carbonized hull, if you will. Now, and I, I've looked at the uh, actual plans of the building, um, the, the, the schematics, and it looks like the support columns are on the outside and uh, to some extent on the inside, very similar to the uh, uh, World Trade Center, uh, the construction, that is. And uh, it burned. It burned ferociously. It, it killed scores of people, uh, which is horrific. There's fif- of course. fifty counts so far. Yeah. So and and, and there's still some sixty something or, or seventy people missing. Now, and it burned so hot, in fact, 
that uh, the investigators, the police and fire are, are uh, fearing they may not be able to identify all the dead. Um, now, that's 24 stories. Okay, 24 stories, 20 stories uh, of those were residential. And the building did not collapse. The building did not. Okay, so it wasn't hit by a plane. I, I get that. But it burned. It completely burned out. There was no mm -hmm. buckling. The, st of the steel support structures, um, it didn't fall in under its own weight, none of that. Even though the construction, like I said, is very similar to that of the World Trade Center. Uh, now, is it like for like? Of course it isn't. In the World Trade Center, I think we had, uh, 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 help me out there, 200 stories? Maybe uh, yeah, like but that, it's just, it, but it, it used a steel exoskeleton uh, yeah. that was uh, in tension. Yes, correct. So we have a steel exoskeleton here as well, from from what I can see in this, of the schematics. So again, this is this is another uh, point to look at when we discuss uh, 9/11, and, and 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 I know people don't anymore, not really. Um, I, I'm not going to let it go uh, because it is it is uh, um, symptomatic of our time uh, that the crime and the cover up. Uh, and on that, just very quickly, I'm watching a show called House of Cards, which initially I thought was a um, a take or a takeoff of the uh, Clinton administration, uh, but but it's clear to me that it gets much further. So I'm sure the elements of the Clinton administration, Bush, Bush administration, and even now some some of the uh, Trump administration is being satirized to some extent. It's it's a show that I, I recommend everybody to watch. It's like yes, Prime Minister, only not funny. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Minister was funny, and the British do it really well. Um, uh, everything though is, is completely true, which is a scary thing. Whereas here in in House yeah. of Cards, I think. I think House of Cards is also a, a, a House of Cards. Sorry, is, is is a fairly accurate description of um, of what that uh, uh, of what politics at that level looks like: horse trading, uh, corruption, murder, uh, anything to stay in power, pretty much. That's that's what the game is: anything to stay in power. So, so that's that's all I wanted to say about this um, Grandville fire, Dave. I don't know if you wanted to add something, but it's just it didn't collapse. Okay, that's what happened. You're you're right. You're right. It didn't. Uh, the first thing that I noted, because I was watching it on television, I was watching a live feed, and there was a young child, uh, maybe teenager, young teenager, maybe 13 or 14 years old, and he said he'd lived there his whole life, and he had heard stories of developers wanting to, you know, tear the building down, like you already mentioned, Mickey, and uh, sell it, because it's the area, while it was a... It's, uh, you know, evolved in time. Uh, one of the things is that that land has now become worth something. And it wasn't worth very much, say, 20 years ago. It was, a you know, the slum, and no one wanted to buy into that. And now they do. And the, the very wealthy buildings, the wealthy owners and the wealthy residents of the other buildings that are encroaching upon its land saw it as an eyesore, and that's why they spent eleven million dollars dollars on cladding. However, mm -hmm. something really should be taken note here: who, in their right mind, would put flammable cladding on the outside of a building? <laughs> T tell me. The same people that, that put asbestos in schools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, some people had too much asbestos; they had to get rid of, um, and that's one way. It's like the um, uh, that the pine, uh, the, the palm trees shed these little nuts that you always trip over or roll over uh, that people put around pools because they looked nice. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, uh, one generation later and they're all cut down because they're just, uh, the maintenance is too high. So, uh, so this young fellow raised the question live on air in a live cross to a reporter. And he was, you know, the second to be interviewed and he said, in, in his wonderful accent, with his dreadlocks, uh, um, and uh, he said that he believed that the whole thing was a conspiracy, that the, they put this stuff on the outside of the building to burn the building down. The building has to be uh, demolished now because yes. it has structural failures, yep. and that's, that's the end of that. So now, it has, mm. hasn't it, at the cost of 50 lives now become a redevelopment site. Yep. Now, 
I mean, that's the truth of the matter. It is now a redevelopment site. Whether public housing is going to be put back in there or not is another story, and it probably won't. It'll probably be sold and they'll be moved on. And there's two other buildings there. Now, he said that they'd been complaining for years that they needed lift maintenance, and that cost $60,000, and why were they spending $11 million on the outside cladding? He said that didn't make any sense to him at all, and he was one of the residents. So, look, I take his word for it, you know. Um, I feel sorry for them. But, you know, that cladding, when you think about it, where else has it been applied to? Oh, all around the world. So now in Australia there is a deep concern about the cladding. Initially, Mackie, I was under the you know, misbelief that the cladding itself wasn't flammable and that maybe the adhesive they'd used was the flammable agent. Mm-hmm. But when I watched the footage, it was un- unmistakable. It was the cladding. Now, the test yeah. case the test case the week before was that building in China that caught fire. Uh, you should look at my feed, my news feed. So this, this building caught fire on the outside the week before in China. It looked like a test case, Mickey. Uh, look, it's quite possible. That's, uh, that's just what it looked like. <laughs> and and they and the commentators weren't mentioning a thing about the cladding. Oh, there's building fire, and you can see it on, on the outside only burning away from where it had burned up, and then it was burning across on every floor. Mm-hmm. So look, it's a bit a bit awful. It's an awful topic, and I feel sorry for all the people who have lost their lives. But remember, we're just pawns. We're pawns well, look, in a game that's bigger than us that we'll never un- truly understand. And and look, you're right. And, and the, the thing is this: the the, the the sad thing is this: that uh, human lives um, matter to us. Uh, I'm sure, uh, dear listenership, um, Dave and I certainly uh, hold human life in high esteem. But it doesn't seem to matter to the people that are in charge. I mean, look, if the name of the game is power. And, and to, for the most part, it is, right? It's not about wealth. It's not about fame. It's not about any of that. It's about power. Let's be very clear, right? And, and all that comes with it, of course. Um, then what they're doing is, is completely um, acceptable to them. Um, it, is, it is just a, a means to an end. Um, you, you know, sacrifice 50 people, 3,000 people, 50,000 people, 6 million people is completely irrelevant. Um, it really is. And, and, the, and the power is, is what people want. Um, it's alien to most of us, this kind of thinking, but you have to understand that people in power have, have different thought structures and different different mindsets. Uh, some of them are born into power, which uh, further um, alienates them uh, from, uh, well, us, you know, the, the yeast, uh, as it were, <laughs> the common folk. Um, the yeast. It, it, it we have the 20, yeast. 28% of our DNA likeness with yeast, by the way. So, you know, there it's a relative. It is. Oh, look, we're close cousins. Um, so it is. It is. It is um, something that is hard for most people to understand and realize. And uh, the aim of this show has been to educate people, at least uh, to some extent, uh, to the realities of what the elite actually uh, thinks about us. Uh, useless eaters. Useless eaters is what they call mm. us. Um, yeah. And and that's that's truly uh, where they are uh, in their mind. A useless. Eaters, which is which is a little bit of a worry <laughs> in my mind, um, but having said all that, it's it's uh, something we have to deal with. So I don't want anyone to come and say, "Oh, you know, it's crazy talk." You know, you people wouldn't uh, kill people just to make a profit. I mean, it, whenever I hear that, I have to say, Dave, my my uh, my brain curdles up in on itself. <laughs> okay? It starts blistering because I mean that's that's the dumbest. That's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. It, mm-hmm. it just is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and being and since we are talking about uh, dumb things here, let me let me just have one one sure. little. Um, Lock uh, yourself little... out. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can uh, then I'll, then we give you the, the talking stick. So so the problem here is science. And I, I was thinking about this uh, a lot uh, this week. Um, we, we need a new approach to science uh, because it, science is good. The, the empirical method, the scientific method, and all that stuff is good for stuff that you know. Can be measured, can be weighed, can be dissected, you know, uh, can be repeated. That's good. It's great. In fact, the scientific method for all of that stuff is awesome. I would not replace it with anything else. Um, but we need a new approach for all the phenomena that we cannot 
address that way. Yeah, uh, um, uh, and uh, quantum phenomena uh, are, are addressable that way, but we don't get any meaningful answers. So we can certainly uh, study them uh, uh, with the empirical approach, like we have in the past, in the experiment, repeat the experiment, you get the same result, repeat it, you get a different result if you change the conditions. Um, but the, it's, it's a repeatable different result. So, but, but it doesn't get us any closer to an answer. Right? It doesn't. It's, it's like, that, like we need to have a different approach. And then I thought about the social sciences. And, and, I, and I also thought about why is, why is the scientific community so averse to uh, investigating all the phenomena that cannot be measured, weighed, and, and so forth? Well, because it's, 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 uh, it's fraught with uncertainty. Now, the social sciences, uh, which, which are uh, psychology and, and sociology and, and all that wonderful stuff, psychiatry as well to some extent, um, even though it's a, it's a medical science, have, have hit that barrier already. And they have hit it because every human being is different. Every human being is unique. So you have, uh, you have um, spectrum type uh, 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 disorders, spectrum. Autism is a spectrum. Schizophrenia is a spectrum disorder, meaning there are some common elements to your ailments, you know, to the way things have gone wrong for you, but you also have some unique items there. So, so you're now classic, you're classified as a, a, a spectrum autism uh, a person. You know, it's like depending on your, on the severity of your autism, because autism is a blanket term which doesn't actually mean anything because there's so many different variations. Same with schizophrenia, psycho, uh, you know, any, 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 any of the uh, mental uh, disorders that, or well, what we like to call mental disorders anyway. So they have already come to that and they realize that, hey, the scientific method doesn't really work here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this a spectrum thing. That's what I'm just waiting for in the hard sciences. You know, I'm going to get, oh, we have got a spectrum phenomenon. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of phenomena which are classed together, which have similar things happening. But <laughs> in reality, they're all completely different, right? And, and, and the thing is that we haven't got any closer to an answer as to what it is, why it is, and how it is, right? So I, I once again implore any, any scientific uh, uh, people out there, any sciencers, to please consider a different approach to phenomena that we can't uh, um, address in the old-fashioned way. I mean, any of the paranormal uh, uh, phenomena, any any of the uh, ESP, any of the psi uh, phenomena, uh, even the, uh, visitors to some extent, you know, uh, all of the uh, Skinwalker Ranch is, is, uh, is uh, we're going to talk about that in this show cycle, is, is, is a prime example, of course. So how do we now approach this? I think we have to approach those phenomena on an individual basis with an open mind and we have to try different things a whole bunch of different things because if one thing doesn't work trying it again is not going to make it work any better in fact trying the same thing over and over knowing it's going to fail is the very definition of insanity you can't try the same thing over and over expecting a different outcome when it simply doesn't give you a different outcome right so you have to find something more appropriate rant over so science needs to have um a revolution, if you will, Dave. A revolution. Hmm. They should um, start adding significant wads of information to the textbooks and uh, have everyone in tenure undergo courses to learn it all. Mm -hmm. That's my thought on that anyway. Mackie, I wanted to bring something up because, you know, the, the we talk about the 24-hour news cycle and everyone's aware of this and it's just the way it goes. And it's the way it is now. And social media has not helped us at all <laughs> in, this, in this quick cycle of news. In fact, I watched a news story occur in the morning and it wasn't there at the night time. They'd already moved past it. So within 12 hours, that was gone. It wasn't even 24 hours anymore. It was just a 12-hour 12, 12 news cycle. What, wow. what wow, happened to that? <laughs> and, that's great. And so... I was talking to my kids about clickbait, you know, where, where something looks uncontrollable. It, 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 sorry, I should say there's a news story that might be in your feed or in, on a you know, web page. And there's a, a picture with a small text below it. And it's urging you to click it. It's like the, the button that says, do not, you know, don't push. Someone's going to push it. This is what's happening to us at the moment. So in our social media and news feeds, we're seeing uh, articles come through and I can tell if there's a video that is a real video that plays or it's going to send you to an external website just so they can get clicks. 
and whether it's you know you analyze it for it being clickbait i mean is it honestly real or not is it going to lead to a survey where you test your prowess at how well you are as a husband or a wife or a mother or a father you know um and you know answering a survey full of questions and then just go oh 97 percent that's how good i am i'm awesome at being a dad but you don't know if it's just going to give you that answer anyway. And all it did was rob you of your time. So pushing that aside, back to the 24-hour news cycle and clickbait. Well, the stories now are becoming so fast at us in all of our mediums, whether it's the television or social media, or just surfing the net, if, even if you don't have a social media account, to surf in the net, the banners and the ads around it from what you see. Something happens to our brain when we see something that has no information in it. It's something that can be attached to a previous thing that we've seen. Say, I don't know, a race issue or in whichever way you imagine that when I said those words. If, I, if there was a news story that popped up today, you would immediately not have to delve into the story too deep because they're not when they're delivering it to you. The news is so fast paced now, there's no research and it could be as little as three bloggers talking about the same thing that becomes a news story now. It was it's what journalism there's, what, there's no journalism. So this is now to a point where they can, by using an image and a bit of text, incite an emotion in you and use it as a tool rather than displaying an actual story like you would see in a newspaper for instance or a good journal and a good research journalistic approach to a, a news item where instead of just saying building fire cladding what hmm. it was clad there was dead okay so instead of saying, look, we've researched it, this is the product used, the company is sorry, you, do you know what I mean? They didn't go into any depth into it. They did a live cross for 24 hours without even declaring the manufacturer of the of the material. Not even a manufacturer. Didn't even show us this is what it looks like beforehand. This is what it looks like. Look, so let's set up an example of how it, quickly it burns. It's like children's clothing. Or children's toys. They're so highly flammable, it's crazy. Surprise. But this is the big the biggest thing about that fire, Mickey. I just want to bring this out for a sec. Fridge caught fire. A fridge. Every single Western house on the planet has a fridge. The Eastern Bloc countries. Oh, they've got fridges. We've all got fridges. How many house fires have ever been put down to being a fridge fire all of them <laughs> partial credit for me what what <laughs> partial credit pepsi um <laughs> i was not able to find a fridge fire as being the cause of any other house fire ever oh it's a fridge definitely the fridge it was definitely the fridge the fridge caught fire and then for some reason, the entire outside of the apartment block burned. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, so so all I'm saying is, look, um, so be very careful when you see news stories. Be, don't be too quick to analyze the story without doing your own research. And that's why Mickey and I are doing this. We've been doing this for a long time. It's what we do. But now we're, we're watching this. We're watching this change in the media so now they attack you from every angle. Oh, yeah. How do you think, you know, the Clinton News Network, CNN, uh, or Fox for that matter, or any of those out those um, media outlets, how do you think they control the population so well? Because they have, they have beneath them, inside them, people who are engineering ways to get people on side really quickly and effectively 
and they can do it with just a couple of news stories that you don't even seem to think that they are related or connected, but they are. Your brain does it, and they know how to trigger it. So they just build you up with enough information to be able to make a quick determination of something, and you will, without researching yourself, you'll find there really wasn't any story in there anyway, and all they're trying to do is manipulate your opinion. So just be careful. Have a look at, in your own worlds, how that's represented to you and what examples you might find. And if you find any, I'm happy to receive them via email, dave at shinysideout.net. So I'd like to see what you've got because uh, certainly we've found thousands of, just in my own Facebook feed, just in there I can find heaps of them just from today. Mm-hmm. So the same thing, Mackie, is going on, and it's going on all around us, and that is this polar a global polarization of religion. Oh, yes. And if you Absolutely. don't, you have to see it happening. It may not be happening in your town, but you can see it happening on the on the global news. And one of the big issues with that, that I have with that, is I don't think there should be religion in the media. Eliminate it. Just get rid of it. Who cares? What does it matter what people believe in? Are we so frightened that we're, we're scared of anything strange or different? Oh, yeah, we are, actually. If we don't know what it is exactly, then we're afraid of it because it'll change who we are. And that's that's one of the big things that they play on. So they'll play on that. And I know that there was a, a mosque application in my town here, Mackie, where I live. And all the residents said no, all of them. Because the only people who were who vo- who voted to um, to speak about it were anti. And I and I find that tough. I find it tough for those people because I don't think everyone in any particular religion, religion is bad. I think it's just the, the the very few of them that um, that obviously do bad things. And if they're in the media, then we've seen them do bad things. And, you know, there's video evidence, and I'm going to probably believe it. But this is a polarization, and there's a polarization effect going on. And, and if we let it continue, what's the trend? Is this the crusades all over again? Is it, or has it already been going on? The media, Mackie, was so quick this week to... Remember this week it was Qatar was bad, then, oh, we're going to send sell them weapons. Do you remember that? One week, Qatar's off the record. Not going to talk, not going to deal with them again. Sanctions, let's do sanctions now, yeah? They're supporting terrorists. Oh, look at that. Suddenly, let's sell them weapons. Tons of them. Is, does anyone but me notice that? Yes, it's just you. Mickey, it is just me. <laughs> Guess what? We are at the bottom of the first hour. I'm just me. That's great. I'm going to, I'll, I, you can't take back a tweet, can you? Um, no. So, no. All right. So, Trumpy, Trumpy boy, good on you. Whatever you want to do, as long as you're making the world better. That's all I care about. All right. So, we're at the bottom of the first hour, and I'd like to, to quickly say get yourself some great merchandise from the station's website you can buy a cd of your favorite host for a previous season maybe an emp proof thumb drive with thousands of survival documents on there or even maybe a packet of seventy-five thousand seeds but you can make a donation to the station to and follow the instructions and be careful that you, your country allows the importation of seeds. Ours doesn't. But follow the instructions carefully when you're making a donation because the, these things are available to you. I mean, I subscribe to the to the chat room, to the chat room, to the archives. That's what I like. I can do that, and I feel happy with myself. And it, well, I'm continuing the station on by doing that, and it's a perpetual one. I don't have to do anything about it. It just comes out of my money. It's all done, done there, done, done, done. The number to call in if you're in the USA is 347-688-2902. If you listen to the bumpers between shows, you'll also find out there's a you can actually there's a call in number. You can just call in 
and listen without being on air if you want. But there's another way of doing this, and you can, if you've got Skype, you can add Freedom Screen. There's a chat room, though. I want you to jump in the chat room at freedomslips.com. Find your way in there. You don't have to say who you are. There's a randomized name. You, you can be that person and uh, talk to us on air. So it's Dave and Mecky. All right. If you live oh. anywhere else, then do it. Oh, I like it. It was almost subliminal. If you live in Kentucky, you're lucky because you could pick us up on FM. Lucky in Kentucky, WZCR. 101.3 or anywhere else in the world and I do mean anywhere else maybe a military ship in the middle of the Pacific or the ISS it doesn't matter look for what do we look for? Revolution Radio Studio A that's what, that's what we look for Revolution Radio Studio A on any one of those streaming services and you'll find something, whether it's TuneIn.com, Web Radio Central, Receiver Mobile App, Talk Stream Live, Stream Finder, blah, 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 Radio Tuner, Radio Ways. There's tons of them. Uh, you can get an app that Hawk made uh, for Android, Freedom Slips Mobile, or you can get the Shiny Side Out app. And there's more stuff than just listening to the station. It has our news feeds and our you know, YouTube archives and everything on there. So you can do that. And just reminding you, this is show number 275. 278. 200. I love it when he does that. <laughs> now, and, having said all and that, to, one. And today we're talking about Mecky. Yes, we can talk about No, we're not going to talk about <laughs> <laughs> On the no, Mecky show. <laughs> it's all about me, the festival of Mecky. No, it is in fact about the Mandela effect. Uh, in fact, uh, it is it is also about uh, dimensional shifts because as i went through this dave uh, and we discussed this i remember it differently <laughs> right yeah, me too what no no <laughs> we never spoke about anything um <laughs> <laughs> the it's it's hard to discuss the Mandela effect without uh, discussing uh, the shows that we did on, on dimensional shift dimensional travel mm. uh, in fact it was show number eight for us and then again 47 and again now i guess uh, 275 uh, the Mandela effect though it, it had me stumped as i said because i wasn't aware of it um, that's really funny I know right and uh, it, because I went to the show notes and show 47 would have been in 2012 to maybe 2013 actually um, mm -hmm. oh, no, 12. anyway it doesn't matter the point is I should have come across it as I as uh, you know as I did some of the research um, uh, Dave also didn't mention it to me at the time so uh, it's it, to me it was it was a, the Mandela effect itself was a bit of a Mandela effect. But before we start with the Mandela effect, I want to put something out there, and I want to ask the um, audience, all the listenership out there, and I'm going to post it too in the um, Facebook groups on the Mandela effect, whether or not this is a Mandela effect. So uh, when I was uh, making some money uh, in the 90s, I managed to purchase a Maui gym sunglasses. Um, by my Wave at the status symbol there. <laughs> no, but they're really good sunglasses, so I wanted to buy them. I did buy them. It was a lot of money for me then, right? A lot of money. But I had them. That's a nice they were very good. Yeah, no, but they're very, no, look, they're really good sunglasses. I got nothing for this, but I just if, if, if I come across something that's really good, guys, I will tell you. So so here they are, and I put them on, and they're, they're, they're polarized. Now, apparently I've got like a rare earth thing that's covering them, you know, which allows for the polarization. And they're different to other polarized sunglasses that I have. Uh, had not owned but had on my face and uh, looked through and the funny thing is this Dave as I looked mm -hmm. through them for the very first time I had like a memory flash and uh, the memory flash I had was to my childhood and how things looked in sunlight so I, I, mm -hmm. I grew up in Germany um, which is you know obviously slightly different to Australia and everywhere else but, but the point is when I looked through those particular polarized Maui sunglasses it that's exactly that's exactly how the world looked to me when I was a child. Wow. Okay, so the, whatever the polarization effect was, the sunglasses had on my eyes, it, everything, the, 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 the quality of the light, the quality of the colors, was exactly how I remembered the world to look like from my childhood. Now, I've been back to Germany since, in summer as well. It doesn't look like I remember it, but with those uh, polarized sunglasses, it does. So now, I don't know if it's a Mandela effect or not, uh, but it certainly uh, uh, had me stumped. And I go, oh, this is odd, uh, Dave. Um, very, very strange. Um, first up, though, guys, i, I got to give you a, a warning. 
um, about this show. Uh, the entire show is a tinfoil hat show. Uh, so please fasten your seatbelts, adjust your tinfoil hats, ensuring the shiny side faces out and suspend all preconceived ideas. Dave, there's a warning about photography, I'm sure. Yeah, keep your hands inside the vehicle at all times. And there's no flash photography. I love that. All right. So uh, now uh, the reason we're saying this is because there is no hard evidence for any of this. Zero. Zero hard evidence. And, uh, and we're going to share with you also what the, the uh, rational scientists think about the Mandela effect. We're going to talk about confabulation, false memories, and all those wonderful things. Um, but we also have to talk about dimensional travel because essentially what the Mandela uh, effect uh, supposes, I guess, is that uh, we are shifting from reality to reality, but but not all at the same time, Dave. See, that's the thing. We're not all shifting uh, at the same time, and we're not all shifting uh, to the same tune. And uh, some of us have some memories, and others have completely different memories. I saw this one thing about the Statue of Liberty uh, as I was looking through the research uh, for the show, and and some people remember the Statue of Liberty being on, on Liberty Island, and others say it's on Ellis Island. Okay, and and uh, some say the Statue of Liberty. Had the torch on the left hand, right hand, whatever. So, I mean, it goes down to that level. And I mean, I guess as, as, as if, if there were some kind of dimensional bleed, or if, if you were to uh, shift through dimensions, as it were, for whatever reason, uh, you know, be it an accident or design, um, it would be those differences, right? It would be those differences that, that uh, would have you stumped. And eventually, I mean, most of us would just dismiss it, I think, Dave. We would just think, ah, oh, I must misremember it. Until you realize there's a lot of people out there that have similar memories to you or the same memories. And, and you go, oh, that's odd. And we're going to share some of those with you guys as well. Some of the most uh, uh, um, famous ones, I guess, where a lot of people seem to remember one thing, but the reality is uh, something else altogether. Now, Dave, before we get into the actual uh, content, it, what is your take on the Mandela effect there? Hmm. <coughs> It is. It's one of those things. I was actually discussing this in the week leading up to the show, Mackie, uh, with some colleagues, and I said, "Look, what do you what do you think of this?" Mm. And they said, "Oh, clearly the people just have the wrong memory. They have a memory that uh, you know, for whatever purpose, isn't the right one." That was the common theme. I said, "Well, yeah, that's good, but how do you think they derived it?" And then I think the light bulb went on. That's the light bulb moment. Yep. Because if you have such a large sample set as to say half the country, for instance, believes in one history and the other half, for whatever purpose, has a different recollection, mm -hmm. then how was that generated? And... It, that's, to me, the most interesting component of this entire Mandela effect because it could very well be that we've been shifted one person at a time. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe there was a magnetic event where there was a, you know, and I say these, these words because that's what I'm familiar with like a temporal disturbance where the timelines merged or there was a swapping over of people from one dimension to another where that did exist or where that, that occurrence had taken place. I don't believe it was as simple as one news outlet decided to run the story and then later found it wasn't true mm -hmm. and then no one saw the retraction. Because, you know, they print it in a paper in a little column and, you know, and they don't care. Yep. You know, I don't think it was as simple as that. And, you know, that Arkham's Razor thing, people in their armchair debunkers hmm. are going to say those kinds of things. So to me, I'm actually more leaning towards there being a temporal dis disruption or, you know, some phase shift some interlinking between two dimensions or in fact they're shifting everyone into this virtual reality into a virtual world or maybe it was the time in which they took them they plucked them out i i don't know mm -hmm. 
but that's that's to me and i don't think it's it's down to an individual i don't think the individual just just uh, you know has a hard time remembering it and came up with the answer that most suited them i don't think the people are lying because i remember mandela being announced dead i was I, I was from that timeline you know um i also i also seem to remember the mandela <coughs> death which is odd um early 90s though for me it was 94 93 i can't remember exactly but that's that's when i thought he had passed away now clearly he hasn't um no uh, and and you know some people believe he died in the 80s uh, but again Oh, Mackie's, Mackie is still with me. It looks like his um, his Skype is frozen. Oh, this this is really very um, very uh, strange. Um, he's back again. <laughs> Getting maybe too controversial. Who knows? Uh, EZP has just uh, uh, shared a, a page in, in the in the chat room called gaslighting or gaslighting, mm -hmm. um, and it's a form of manipulation that seeks to sow seeds of doubt on a target individual members of a group, hoping to make target question their memory, perception, and sanity. Um, well, you know, n nobody actually targeted me with anything, uh, EZP. Um, so if somebody had done that, fair enough. But nobody actually came to me and said this is what happened. So. But I remember certain things, and I, I know that they're actually not the case. But the, the strongest Mandela effect, too, that I had uh, personally were, one, uh, there was a path at my brother's house or my mom's brother's house that um, uh, now goes straight. It goes straight uh, through a garden. It's the, the stepping stones that are going straight from, from the entrance through the garden to the wall. Now, I remember it as, as curving around uh, quite significantly, in fact, uh, almost at a 90-degree angle to the wall. And I said this to my wife, and she agrees with me. But my brother says, not. Nah, it's always been straight. Now, again, you know, who who, who knows? Uh, you know, it could be mis misremembered. And then there's the case of the um, Chinese rice ball. <laughs> the case of the Chinese rice ball. Um, and what that is, it, it, I, I always uh, used to um, ride my bicycle across the Harbor Bridge from uh, where we lived into Chinatown uh, to on a Sunday morning, Saturday morning, uh, to go to a Chinese bakery to pick up these uh, rice balls. They're just a uh, glutinous rice balls. Rice balls filled with, uh, you know, uh, red beans uh, or, or, or coconuts. It's a, it's a sweet. It's a sweet. So so we have them for breakfast or afternoon tea. So and then I would pick them up and, and drive back home across the bridge uh, on my bicycle. And uh, and I always remember them as being part the size, uh, oh, like a, a, a fairly, uh, like a golf. Uh, sorry, half the size maybe of a golf ball, or maybe sorry, maybe eighty percent the size of a golf ball. But the ones that are there now are significantly larger. You know. Almost almost, uh, uh, you know, 50% the size of a golf ball. And my brother tells me that's the size they've always been. <clears throat> I said, no, they used to be much smaller. He goes, nope, they've always been this big. So, again, uh, am I uh, uh, at fault here? Am I misremembering it? Is he? I don't know. But the point is, these are my my two uh, examples. Um, let's, let's, let's talk about the um, Medan effect. Because let's let's first discover where it came from. How did it all start? Right? Uh, referred to as confabulation in psychiatry. Some have speculated that the memories are caused by parallel universes spilling into our own, while others explain the phenomenon as a failure of collective memory. And this is the origin. In 2010, uh, blogger Fiona Broom coined the term Mandela Effect to describe a collective false memory she discovered at the Dragon Con Convention, where many others believed that former South African President Nelson Mandela died during his imprisonment in the 1980s. That year, Broom launched the site MandelaEffect.com to document various examples of the phenomenon. And uh, this is now quoting her. See, I thought Nelson Mandela died in prison. I thought I remembered it clearly, complete with news clips of his funeral, the morning in South Africa, some rioting in cities, and the heartfelt speech by his widow. Then I found out he was still alive. Additionally, Broom described uh, other widely held false memories, including various non-existent Star Trek episodes and the death of the Reverend Billy Graham, Dave. Wow. <laughs> wow, that, that floors me. Spread. On August 23rd, 2012, a post titled... Berenstein Bears. We are living in our own parallel universe. Uh, 
was published on the blog the wooden sorry the wood beaten worlds sorry wood between the wood between worlds which was described in widespread memory of the children's book series berenstein bears or berenstein explaining the false memory at the result of an alternate reality spilling into our own in december 2013 the uh, Mandela effect. What's that? Reddit? Subreddit? Subreddit? Yep. Okay. Was launched for discussions about the phenomenon. On November 29th, 2014, a YouTube channel, Shine the Light 73, uploaded a video titled The Mandela Effect Exploded after the 2014 15 biblical blood moon. Tetrid, which garnered upwards of 900,000 views and 2,200 comments over the next three years. Yeah. Now, um, believe it or not, <coughs> this is not part of the notes, Dave, but uh, I, just I just remembered, there is a movie um, coming out uh, called The Mandela Effect. And there's also a TV series called The Mandela Effect. Um, and dealing with exactly what we talked about. Uh, so the movies, it's like a horror, sci-fi, whatever. You know, and the TV series, it's in post-production. And the movie is also production. So I think this, this could be interesting. Uh, this has now garnered enough uh, momentum to generate both TV shows and movies. Um, but this this one, the one that Dave just mentioned, the Baron Stain uh, versus Baron Stain con controversy. As we did our research, um, there was one. I remember one post on, on the um, Mandela Effect uh, site on Facebook from one person uh, who, who said, "Now again, you can take it, you know, any which way you want. You can, you know, don't believe it, believe it. It's up to you." But the post was this. Uh, the post said, "I remember as a child, I always wondered how I should pronounce the word. Should I pronounce it Baron Stein or should I pronounce it Baron Stain?" He wouldn't, or he said then, I wouldn't have had that issue if it had said Baron Stain. Now, one, he could be lying, and that never happened. Okay, so if that's the case, then you know, none of it matters. Two, he could have misread it. You know, as a child, you know, maybe he misread Stain as Stain. Or three, it was in fact Baron Stain, right, or Stein. And he puzzled as to how to pronounce it properly, because the word Stein, meaning stone, is of, uh, of a Germanic derivation, and you can pronounce it either Stein, or Stein, in fact, or Stein, uh, if you wanted to do the um, uh, the English way. So, so ha as a child growing up in an English-speaking country, it's it's a, it's a fair question to ask: How should I pronounce this? Should I say Baron Stein? Sorry, Baron Stein, Baron Stein, Baron Stein. You know what 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 is the uh, correct pronunciation? Like Frankenstein, is it Frankenstein? Frankenstein, mm -hmm. Frankenstein. I mean, the, the actual pronunciation in German is Frankenstein. Right, Frankenstein, but uh, it's now it's a Frankenstein monster, a Frankenstein monster, or whatever it is, right? So, so this is really uh, a, a very interesting uh, post. Uh, if he lied, then you know, um, forget what I said. But if he didn't, that poster, it was a guy. Then uh, um, let's let's uh, investigate this further. Now, having said all of this, um, having said all of this, before we can talk any further about the Mandela effect, we need to revisit international travel uh, very quickly. Uh, there were show number eight and forty-seven. In the shiny side out timeline, maybe not for you. Maybe for us, welcome to eight. I don't know. So, what is the dimension? There are three spatial dimensions. I know I'm gonna tell anyone how to suck X, but it's important. In which we have free movement. There's one dimension of perceived duration, which we choose to call time, and we have no movement except in one direction, right? And seemingly forward. And we've discussed time now uh, at nauseum. And um, all of these four dimensions appear to exist at right angles to each other. You know, at right angles. I, I contend that time, if in fact, is... is ...that exists at a right angle. Now, does, does that mean that initial dimension, like any four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, are they all at right angles? And the answer is probably yes. In other words, would a parallel Earth dimension be at right angles to this Earth dimension? Probably. And if you look at some of the math and some of the way it has been uh, described visually, that's probably true. Meaning, of course, that the four observer dimensions uh, here as a group are at right angles uh, to the other Earth groups. Do you know what I mean? 
But at the same time, all dimensions within each group are at right angles to each other. So you've got all angle, all dimensions that we are perceiving here at right angles, and that's let's call this our little uh, sphere of dimension. That's where we lift our Earth dimension, and then another Earth, you know, like another dimensional Earth, is at a right angle to our Earth, so to speak. Uh, now, Dave, what does math and physics tell us? Hmm. Everything, Mackie. I science. You mentioned that at the top of the show. I, I do. <laughs> yes. String theory allowed for 10 separate dimensions. That's what it allows for. But the M theory added one more to the equation. That's 11. This was important because this extra dimension allowed for strings to stretch. These brains, that's what they're called, B-R-A-N-E-S, as they were now called, could grow and stretch to enormous sizes, probably even as great as the universe itself. Even more bewildering was the discovery that these brains, that's the little stretchy strings, could be so unbelievably long that they were in reality very thin indeed, probably no more than a millimetre or two in width. Trapped within a dimension... The existence of an extra dimension led to the exciting conclusion that one dimension could be as close to us as our skin and we would be totally unaware of its existence. This is because we are essentially trapped within our own dimension so that particles are unable to interact with any of the other dimensions, even though they might lie within very close proximity or be within it. They can be within it, they can traverse it, they could be cut through it, but and but they are unable to interact. Theorists have explained this lack of interdimensional passage in terms of the physical nature of strings, which is, in most cases, is an open-ended loop that binds matter to our dimension, rather like glue binds the surface that it bonds with. Yes. Just so you can get that, just a pause for a second. You take that in. But Which, then, right? but then, Mecky, th with all of these dimensions, where's the mass? And with mass, yeah. we should have gravity. So this is the mystery of gravity. So it is entirely impossible. Oh, hang on. I've got a third, a second keyboard giving me mischief here. All right. It is so entirely, so, so is it entirely possible, impossible for interdimensional activity to take place? For some time, it seems that it was impossible. But then the answer appeared to come through one of the most mystifying forces of nature, gravity. Gravity has always baffled scientists and astronomers because although it binds the course of the stars and the planets, and it's essentially a very weak force though, yet it seemed to the string theorists that there was an answer for this weakness because gravitons with their closed loops were not tied down and appeared exactly the sort of force that could quite literally seep away into other dimensions. You have to think, remember, I remember, Mackie, the whole idea about dark matter was because their calculation said there should have been tons more gravity in the universe, tons more mass in the universe, and where is it all? If it's all holding itself together, where is it? Interdimensional um, spheres or alternate you know, uh, realities or other dimensions – however you want to put it, is a great way of losing that mass that we couldn't see into another dimension. And therefore, that's why the gravity is so weak, is because that same mass is actually mass in more than one dimension. And its gravity is leaked into another one. There you go. I just love that. I love that. It's better than dark matter, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, look, and that's true. So, so if if gravity were, were in fact um, the connecting force between dimensions, it would also um, um, explain a, a, a higher physics or higher mathematics, meaning that gravity actually binds all the dimensions together. So, I mean, 
Well, I mean, if, if you look at the, the stars and the universe and solar systems and so forth and, and galaxies, so it, there's, this, there's an organizing principle around gravity where things are uh, attracted to each other. Now, imagine mm -hmm. the same thing. Imagine the same thing on a higher dimensional plane with gravity still being the force that, uh, that um, binds or, uh, things together or allows things to attract each other. So gravity would attract all these dimensions uh, to each other <coughs> in a way, you know what I mean? So it's, it's a binding force and it would explain why it's so weak because it is stretched, in fact, across all of the dimensions. If that is true then, and if we're truly living in a multiverse or multidimensional universe, then or metaverse, then that would, in fact, gravity is in fact the strongest force in existence, in theory, if you, if you, if you think it through right to the end. Um, but this is fascinating stuff, guys, right? And so now, what's that got to do with the Mandela effect? Well, if, well, gravity is something we can we can uh, measure and, and you know, we, we, we feel the effect of. No idea how it's generated really at this point, and it's very weak. Um, so it could potentially link dimensions together. So is, is the gravity then, or, gra or the gravity wave or some kind of gravity function, that, is that what allows us to traverse different dimensions? Uh, if there's a strong gravity, maybe gravitational flux, if there's uh, something wrong with that particular force, does it allow people to slip through into or fall through a rift, or is, is it done by design? I, I don't know, I don't know. But if you have something binding something together, like, like a string that binds together pearls, Think of gravity as a string that runs through all the pearls on your pearl chain. In theory, particulate matter from uh, one pearl could travel uh, to another pearl. I mean, if you rub them together, you know, I mean, a, a, a tiny little fraction or, or, or like a piece of pearl could travel along the string to get to get to another pearl. Uh, obviously, this 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 force, gravity, uh, as we call it, would be all pervading, not not really like a string per se, but like a force going through everything. Uh, and, and maybe even uh, holding the underlying quantum form together. Look, now, now we're completely speculating, of course. That's why I said this is uh, tinfoil head territory, guys. But Dave, this is this is uh, one of those mysteries where you know science doesn't provide us a clear answer. I mean, people say oh, it's a false memory Mandela effect, and you know you're all you know crazy, and you know it's it's you're being deceived, and all these wonderful things. Whereas we might be standing at the threshold of an astounding uh, uh, discovery. Of an astounding uh, uh, insight into into the nature of, of our existence uh, of the of the multiverse, in fact, right? Um, which brings us to Flatland, which I know Dave's mm -hmm. favorite subject to be. It uh, is. I don't think we. I don't think we're getting the music anyway. <laughs> the music is no, gone, so we are at the end of the first yeah. hour. But Dave, talk about Flatland, sir. There's two things that I love the most in the entire universe, and one is quantum theory and the other is flatland <laughs> the double slit experiment in flatland so what we need to do is we need to fire the book flatland through a double slit and see what happens mackie yeah, um it. all right so in flatland it's a story which which grew my imagination that's what it did when i read it i had a a new a new way of looking at earth a new way of looking at the people here and the complexity that was added to my life was attempting to understand, well, not let's not call it the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, fourth being time, fifth being another one, all right? So Flatland was a story about shapes in a two-dimensional only world, not our three-dimensional world, but in a two-dimensional world where their third dimension was their time. And one of the shapes was plucked out of that environment and and was given the ability to look down upon its world from above from his point of view for from the, the protagonist's point of view all th the only way they could recognize other people was by the, the number of sides they had whether it was a circle a triangle or a square or continue uh, in a parallelogram that's how they worked out who they were. That was their personality. That was that identified them. And so, by looking down, by giving by be giving that shape the opportunity to look down and to actually visually identify those shapes, that was an astounding moment in the book. Of course, then the piece is put back down into its world. You know, all the goodbyes are said, and it tries to explain that view. To the other people 
which was the third and final piece of that book, that was the hard part because how do you explain something that you can only, you can't draw because it's only two dimensions. Uh, you can only describe it to them, but how do you describe something that they've never seen? It's like describing the color red to someone who's vision impaired. Yeah, that's the hard part. So when what you're supposed to do is take away from this how difficult it would be as a human to perceive the fourth dimension or a fourth or say let's call it fifth if fourth is meant to be time, then how do we describe this to anyone else? Say you had the opportunity to be plucked out of this world and held between those fears the spheres on the plane, which has been described in ancient text and the Bible about the universe. The universe is made up as spheres and each sphere is its own dimension. And they all on a, on like the surface of the ocean in a way. And if you're plucked out of one and you get to see, well, it's a, it's a landscape for as far as the eye can see of this surface of undulating water but it's not they're all made of spheres and each one's a dimension how do you tell someone else when you're returned back to this dimension again how do you explain it well i just described how the ancients described the dimensions and the other worlds and the description of which you can't traverse those spheres like we don't have the technology to imagine Mecky, imagine if we're time travelers and we stumble upon someone and they go, so how do you do it? And you go, oh, actually, it's just, I mean, it's complicated. Best said, you know, the wheel spins and we go through time and they go, okay, spinning wheels. It's all about spinning wheels. So they, they spin wheels and it doesn't go through time for them. Yeah, so it's this, it's the layman's terms description of it to the people at the time no pun intended, that you won't be able to traverse. You can't. We can You can't. Yeah? So just like the the people in World War II with their, you know, their P-51 who landed on an island and they're trying to say, well, you know, we can fly these planes that you can't. You don't know how to fly them. They don't even know what the fuel is that goes in the plane. We understand that totally. We have a total concept of it. These people who have never seen it before wouldn't have any idea. So this is the hard part. So how, how can we only perceive our four dimensions? How can we see it? How can we describe it? In fact, if you were to perceive higher dimensions, let's for argument's sake, Say, say that, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh dimension in a tesseract, for example, you know, the hypercube, you would actually not be able to look at it properly. It, it would be, I would like, I'd like to think it'd be like a blurred thing, like a just slightly out of focus. So you couldn't actually focus on it okay? because, because we're not equipped to see it. Right, in our present form, we're not completely unequipped to see it. Um, if you've had oh, Mickey, Mickey, I, I think it, so, so I mean, if you had a shape, that wasn't supposed to be in three dimensions, that it occupied also another another dimension, a fourth dimension, we wouldn't be able to see it. You're right. We wouldn't be able to see it in its entirety. Correct. That's exactly right. So some people believe that we, in fact, like human beings, might be uh, four-dimensional shadows of five or six-dimensional beings. <laughs> it's not theory, and I can't really disagree with it. Certainly our brains seem to work on, on different levels as well. So this is important to understand that we talk about these dimensions, uh, but even if you stumble, if you, even if you fell over one, <laughs> you probably wouldn't be able to see it because you're simply not equipped to see it. I've spoken to people that uh, are um, uh, experimenting with with drugs and, and you know uh, different things, um, and, and what they've described to me is is, is um, a, a higher level of perception. Meaning, when one experience was around the flow of time, the person I spoke to said, "Oh well, you know, the flow of time for me didn't exist when I was in this state." Not, like everything was at the same time, there was there was no actual flow of time, um, which which is a very interesting uh, way to look at it as well. So so, uh, I think we have the capability, we have the capacity to see or experience or perceive uh, um, higher dimensional uh, context. Um, very difficult though to process it once we uh, come back to our limited selves in a way, right? Now 
Let, let's talk that's quickly. Me- Mackie, huh? that's just like that's like dreams where everything seems to make sense and you understand it totally and there's no thought. You don't actually have to think about anything. What you're presented with already you have a full grasp of. But where yeah. outside of outside of your dream, yeah. you have to think about things. Yeah. And it's the thinking about things which means you don't have a solution and you're trying to analyze it. Where in a dream state, in that there is no time, Mackie, and everything seems to make sense. No, that's, that's exactly right. That's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now, I don't want to go into the visible light, but just just again, there, there are limitations on our perception. Dave just pointed out the limit, the dimensional perceptions that we uh, uh, that we are limited to uh, with flat land. The visible light is the same. Uh, we've um, talked about the uh, entire spectrum of frequencies before. Visible light is is infinitesimally small <laughs> on that spectrum, very very tiny, and uh, we can't really perceive in the ultraviolet or infrared. We can perceive heat. We can't see it though, and ultraviolet we can't uh, perceive of. Uh, I have all. a graphic and up, then, Mackie, that makes that makes oh, sense for the viewers. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Now, see, so yeah, if you look at that, you can see where we sit. It's a tiny little uh, spectrum. So, but this, but make no mistake, these frequencies are real. I mean, we, we, there's TV and radio, right? <laughs> We're talking right now on frequencies you cannot see, and you need equipment uh, to decode for you, uh, be it a computer or radio, whatever it might be, right? So, in order of for it to come down to a frequency that you can perceive, be it visual or auditory. And um, now let's talk about a second though about the um, uh, for a second about the multiverse uh, theories. Um, it, the multiverse theory, uh, and, and in fact the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum uh, physics, we talked about the many worlds the theory, uh, says there are an infinite number of universes uh, coexisting in some higher dimensional form or ether. We've talked about this before as well. And we mean infinite number, meaning uh, uh, universes without end. So, which would also explain uh, superposition and quantum decoherence, because again, scientists say that everything is possible until you look at it. Uh, I'm grossly simplifying things. <laughs> okay, I mean, horribly. And like, like I always say, if you're a quantum physicist, you know, physicist, then you probably want to hang me. But I'm trying to make it accessible to to people. And, and I know it's not entirely correct, but it only crystallizes when it could decoheres into what we perceive as the constant. Now, now, but the others still exist. That's the point, right? The others, we just can't perceive them. That's all. They are intrinsically self-consistent, the other universes. And uh, we also think they're separate from uh, from each other, right? So, uh, except maybe for the occasional uh, rifts or bleeds. Okay? Uh, and, and maybe they need to be a, a temporary. And maybe there's some kind of localized alignment. right? Maybe some kind of gateway that is possible between universes. I mean, we, we, we just don't know enough. Right now, could could something slip through? Uh, and and this is t- speaking directly to the Mandela effect. Um, have people shifted? Right? Clearly, there was no physical sensation for most people, right? Otherwise, they would remember. Oh yeah, I, I, I slipped, or you know, I fell through a hole, or whatever it might be. But that clearly isn't the case because we don't have that kind of testimony. The only thing that comes close is my own testimony. Um, which, which uh, again, you, you can you can uh, not uh, you can not uh, you can choose not to believe me, which is cool. But I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you exactly what happened to me. Uh, this has to do with déjà vu. Uh, Dave, I've spoken about this many times, but mm-hmm. it's here. So I had this uh, déjà vu experience, and, and and you know, just before it happens, you remember it all. Oh, this is what's going to happen next. And I chose not to do that. And it was a it was a inane task. It was some some really um, menial or like a completely meaningless uh, act which i think was taking a plate out of the cupboard and mm-hmm. putting it on the counters just that right and I, was, I saw myself taking the plate and putting it on the counter <clears throat> that was back in germany when i was oh, i want to lie to you i'm maybe 12 or 13 years old i can't remember but it was in the kitchen i remember it was in the kitchen my mom's kitchen i was there by myself but i didn't do it i didn't do what my deja vu uh, told me was going to happen and i felt like an, and dave uh, um called like uh, shifting, not not shifting, uh, the jumping, jumping, jumping tracks. tracks. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, and that 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 jarring sensa- sensation is probably the best, uh, the best uh, description I can give you guys. Like like Dave said, like jumping of tracks, like a jarring thing. No, there was no sound or, or there was not the the world didn't shake, nothing like that. It was more like an internalized thing, where it was like it was just a bit of a yeah, like a jarring jumping of of, of tracks kind of thing. So that's that's my. 
uh, a little take on if it's possible or not to to um, to shift in dimensions. Maybe maybe you can, or maybe I just um, maybe I just uh, broke my little piece of the matrix at that point. <laughs> um, now we we have spoken about this uh, before, um, and there are phenomena discussed uh, that we discussed over the last six years that are very intimately related, such as uh, quantum tunneling, uh, quantum entanglement. If there's such a thing as quantum entanglement, is it possible to entangle particles across different universes? Um, since we don't know how it works, I will say yes. <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to go on the record <laughs> as saying, I can, I can quantum entangle particles across different universes. There you go, boom. Because if you think about it, Dave, the, the, the entanglement, the, the entanglement um, itself is completely non sequitur like it, it 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 goes against the grain we we don't understand it right it doesn't make any sense and because it doesn't make any sense it is mm -hmm. probably outside this particular reality as we understand it right clearly some form of communication is happening right between the two particles or in fact is it the same particle or is there no space and if there's no space there can't be any time and everything is uh, uh, completely wrong anyway right now there's one more thing, and then uh, I want to get Dave to talk about interdimensional hypothesis. Um, it's uh, Mi Michio Kaku, and uh, I don't think he'll ever come to our show, but uh, I'd like for him to be here one day. Uh, in his book, Parallel Worlds, uh, published in 2005, um, page 20, writes that civilizations trillions of years older than us possibly could possibly find ways to leave their dying universe via wormholes or black holes, time warps, and travel to other younger and warmer universes. Now, if you're that advanced and you could travel between universes, which is, by the way, one of my favorite things to read about in science fiction, <laughs> I really, really love it. Any show that has to do anything with dimensional travel or time travel, I'm, I'm all in it. I don't care how bad the dialogue is. <laughs> I, really I just love the concept. But look, even, even scientists like Michio Kaku and others, of course, um, have uh, have uh, supposed that it is a possibility you know, that that uh, we can break uh, the dimensional barrier. I mean, we've we've broken the sound barrier. I'm convinced we have broken the light barrier, and if not uh, not already, we will soon. We've broken uh, many other barriers. We will probably break the time barrier if we haven't already done so. I mean, every barrier that was set in front of us. I mean, crossing an ocean, impossible, impossible, can't be done. The trains going faster than uh, 60 miles an hour, impossible, can't be done. Any, any anything that blocked us at any stage of our development of our uh, ingenuity was overcome. Every single thing was overcome. I do believe that it will be overcome again um, for the very simple reason that we are creating this reality every time. Right? And if we can imagine it, if we can imagine it, it can happen. Right? I think that's the world we live in. But Dave, what is the interdimensional hypothesis? Okay, it's also called the extra dimensional hypothesis or EDH. So you you have IDH and EDH. It's it's an advanced theory by Jacques Vallée that says unidentified flying objects or UFOs and related events involved visitations from other realities or dimensions that coexist separately alongside our own. It is an alternative to the extraterrestrial hypothesis, or the ETH. So the EDH, extra-dimensional or interdimensional IDH, as opposed to ETH. IDH also holds that UFOs are a modern, modern manifestation of a phenomenon that has occurred throughout recorded human history, which in prior ages were ascribed to mythological or supernatural creatures, or, and I'm going to extend that to gods as well. Although the extra, uh, the ETH, the extra extra testicle, extra terrestrial. <laughs> and wouldn't we all like one? <laughs> Oh, there'd be no running events in the Olympics. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Goodness me. Okay, so although it's re remained a predominant explanation for UFOs, that's the extraterrestrial version, 
by ufologists, and some ufologists have abandoned it in favor of IDH, so interdimensional. Paranormal researcher Brad Steiger wrote that we are dealing with multidimensional paraphysical phenomenon that is largely indigenous to planet Earth. That's an extraordinary thing. Think about that. Other ufologists, such as John Ackenberg and John Weldon, advocate IDH, the interdimensional, because it fits the explanation of a UFO as a spiritistic phenomenon, comment, commenting um, on the disparity between e the ETH, the accounts that people have made of UFO encounters. Ankenberg and Weldon wrote that the UFO phenomenon simply does not behave like extraterrestrial visitors. That's interesting. In the your book UFOs, Operation Trojan Horse, published in 1970, John Keel linked UFOs to supernatural concepts such as ghosts and demons. Gee, haven't we come a long way since? The development of IDH, the interdimensional, as an alternative to the ETH increased in the 1970s and 80s with the publication of books by Valet and by Heineck. In 1975, both Valet and Heineck advocated the hypothesis in The Edge of Reality, a progress report on unidentified flying objects, and further in Valet's book, 1979, Messengers of Deception, UFO Contacts and Cults. Some UFO proponents accepted IDH, the interdimensional, because the distance between stars makes interstellar travel impractical, to our way of thinking, using conventional means, and nobody has demonstrated an anti-gravity or faster than light travel hypothesis that could explain extraterrestrial machines. I'm just going to pause there, Mickey, and I'll let you take the rest, but they're, they're also not stating the moon as a base or the IDH means that they're already here on earth anyway. And they have been for a long time. So which way do you go, Mackie? Cause I sort of, I look at IDH now more than extraterrestrial. I don't care where they've come from, but they're here and they've been so, here for a while. That's my belief. And look, and I completely agree with you. Um, in fact, there's something called the, um, parallel civilization or the hidden civilization that has been here alongside us all along. Mm -hmm. um, I think, in a nutshell, that uh, this planet is, has been inhab uh, inhabited by uh, sentient beings for a lot longer than, than we believe, commonly. Like, I'm talking hundreds of millions of years. I further believe that um, science, far beyond our current understanding, uh, is being used on this planet, uh, has been developed for a long time. I believe that we uh, this particular reality are in fact a created species by a species uh, that came before us. Most creation myths speak of the creation as in our image. We make you in our image. And I think that's exactly what happened. But that's just me, right? And I do believe that the, there's interdimensional travel. Um, I believe that the Nazis uh, got close if they didn't uh, crack it. I believe the Americans are doing it, the Russians are doing it. Um, I believe. Uh, that they are also extra uh, dimensional uh, mm -hmm. activities. I also believe there are extra terrestrial activities happening. So, so I don't have really look that they have been led to believe. A lot more complex, right? And, and again, <clears throat> people always say, oh, you know, where's the evidence? Well, the evidence is all around us. We choose to ignore it. And that's what this show is about, guys, right? We, we bring you a whole bunch of stuff. What, what you do with it is entirely up to you, right? Read up on it, you know, do your own research, follow it up. And most of the guys in the chat room, and even I'm sure you're listening to right now, uh, have done your own, have done your own uh, um, research. Now, it is important though to understand that just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You cannot see radio waves. Very simple example. Very simple example. But guess what? There they are. <laughs> okay, there they are. Um, and it takes a certain level of understanding to. Uh, um, I guess, capture and, and listen to them or do something with them, right? And, and I think as our understanding grows, as our understanding of the natural world grows, as we get more savvy at different things, we become better at decoding reality and what's around us. And I think we're a long way off from understanding 
what it actually is. Now, um, sorry if our audio is uh, is uh, not as it should be. I've, I've got one of the best microphones uh, money can buy, as says Dave. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's not thing. it's not the audio, Mickey. What happens is y- your signal will cease to arrive and then come in one lump without any spaces uh, between the words. Okay, okay, gotcha. Now, uh, but to get back to the text, um, with IDH, it is unnecessary to explain any propulsion method because the IDH holds that UFOs are not spacecraft, but rather devices that travel between different realities. Now, um, in our current scientific understanding, something infinitely more impossible <laughs> than faster than light travel, but Let's leave that to one side. Uh, one advantage of IDH preferred by Hillary Evans is its ability to explain the apparent ability of UFOs to appear and disappear from sight and radar. This is explained as the UFO entering and leaving our dimension, materializing and dematerializing. Moreover, Evans argues that if the other dimension is uh, slightly more advanced than ours, or is our own future, like the time travel type stuff, this would explain the UFO's tendency to represent near future technologies, airships in the 19, sorry, in the 1890s, rockets and supersonic travel in the 1940s, and so on and so forth. Now, that's the interdimensional uh, uh, theory there, guys, or extra dimensional, as the case may be. Now, um, the next one, uh, one of my favorite movies is Dr. Strange Love or I or how I learned mm-hmm. to stop worrying about the bomb. You know, Dr. Strange mm-hmm. how, I stop, <laughs> how I learned to stop worrying about the bomb. Now this this next section I entitled A Critics. Or I or how I stopped worrying about the rational voice. <laughs> Critics or how I stopped worrying about the rational voice. Now Dave, this next section here for the next couple of pages is is the rational, scientifically acceptable um, explanation of uh, the Mandela effect. Why, why don't you uh, start us off and then we'll just uh, see where it takes us. I think I should put my calming voice on for this because this is the convincing part that science would <laughs> want you to believe. That's right. <laughs> the Mandela effect is the pseudo-scientific belief that some differences between one's memories and the real world are caused by changes to the past events in the timeline. Many Mandela Effect believers believe it is caused by accidental travel between alternate universes. It was named after Nelson Mandela. Good for him. (laughs) Whom some people erroneously believe to have died in prison in the 1980s. Another common false memory is thinking the title of the children's book series, The Berenstain Bears, is spelled as the Berenstein Bears. The Mandela Effect has not been explored by mainstream, peer-reviewed publications, and the claim that some false memories are caused by parallel dimensions going berserk is, shall we say, difficult to falsify. And that is really uh, one of the most important things I've ever read in, in in a critical blog. Um, I agree. Mickey, is that all, is that Wikipedia? <laughs> uh, the, no, sorry, this is the rational wiki. This one. Oh, okay, I knew it this came is... from a Wikipedia. Oh, absolutely. Some um, wiki so, <laughs> yeah, look, you know, because we, we have to give everybody the full spectrum, but but it is true. So, see, this is one of those phenomena that I spoke about earlier, where where uh, our scientific method is completely useless. Okay? Empirical science doesn't work because I mean, how they're right? How would you falsify this this memory? You can't. You can't. There's there's nothing you can do unless you can you know somehow uh, manage to um, uh, purposefully and 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 um, and uh, uh, deliberately travel between dimensions. Unless we achieve that, clearly this is beyond the realm of our science. Doesn't mean we should dismiss it, or should uh, or that we should just label it as something crazy. We should still investigate. Now there are alternative explanations, of course, and um, I will try to put on my uh, calming scientific voice. The Mandela Effect hypothesis relies on many untestable or difficult to test assumptions. On the other hand, the phenomenon of human memory being unreliable is well documented in research. So what it says here is, so forget the hypothesis, but what's important here is that, you know, uh, we know that human memory doesn't work well. (laughs) So we'll go with that. Cognitive science professor Elizabeth Loftus has been able to plant, sorry, to plant false memories with ease. And research has shown eyewitness reports to be unreliable. Application 
of Occam's Razor. Uh, suggest the latter is the much more likely explanation. The idea of the Mandela effect is mostly uh, pushed by people who like to think the whole world revolves around themselves. So obviously, if they remember anything differently from others, then the world must be wrong, not their memory. I think I may have lost my esteemed colleague here. Yes, <laughs> his machine just rebooted. Okay, I've, I've, I've got it. Now, uh, in the chat room, Guys, I, I assume you can still all hear me. If, if yes, I know there's a slight delay, please tell me that you can still hear me and I'll keep going here anyways. Okay, um, Shazam is, is the next bit here. One strange example of this phenomenon uh, relates uh, to a children's movie called Shazam, supposedly made in the early 1990s and starring the stand-up comedian Sinbad um, as an incompetent genie. In fact, no such movie was ever made or at least there's no ver verifiable evidence that it was. But many people claim to have vivid memories of watching it repeatedly during the 90s, especially Reddit users on the Mandela Effect, uh, sorry, Mandela Effect subreddit, you know, the page there. Some of these accounts uh, may be explainable as a confused memory of Kazam, a 1996 movie with similar, uh, with a similar premise uh, starring a base, uh, sorry, basketball player Shaquille O'Neal as a genie. <clears throat> Meanwhile, some Shazam believers favor a Mandela effect explanation with alternate timelines in parallel universes, or even a simulated reality hypothesis in which the world we experience is a complex simulation created by an advanced civilization. We've spoken about that at length as well, guys. It is unclear why a cheesy 90s family movie should be a departure point between conflicting realities or program memories in either of these scenarios. Now, I'm going to ignore this comment because the anchor points between realities are completely irrelevant. They are simply uh, the anchor points. <clears throat> and a memory is a memory. Now, if, if this uh, dimensional shift or travel is accidental, then I would expect things that don't matter to, to be uh, remembered. Like, and, and this doesn't matter at all. If it were deliberate, for example, um, you know, then the memory should be, oh, well, Hitler didn't win the war, but in my reality, he did. So, you know, like, so a deliberate interference which changed the timeline or the, or, or the you know, apparent uh, dimensional reality for a person, you know, that makes sense. Whereas if it's an accident and, and you've, you've fallen, as it were, into a dimensional hole, things like this make a lot more sense. You know, where you just shifted between uh, realities willy-nilly in the way, I mean, not, nothing major is different. Mostly. Because again, if, if we are talking about the multiverse, I do believe that similar uh, universes are grouped together. Similar universes are grouped together. That's my belief system. That's what I think. Okay, I can't prove it. That's just what I think. Makes sense to me from a self-organizing principle anyway. You know, and, and as, as you would have uh, similar universes together, then the, the, the differences between those universes would be fairly small. For example, the movie Kazam was never made. The movie Kazam was never made. Uh, in this universe, in another universe, it may have been made, right? And and uh, I do have a very fuzzy memory, even before I read any of this, of Sinbad as a genie in some kind of show. So, and it was definitely not Shaquille O'Neal. I, I know the difference between the two, <laughs> and it was not Shaquille O'Neal that I remember as a genie. It doesn't really matter, though. Uh, uh, but, but the point is, it makes a lot more sense that these inconsequential things would be remembered. Okay? And um, other... Shazam uh, truthers suggest a conspiracy theory in which the film has been intentionally memory hold by its creators due to embarrassment or legal reasons. Uh, now, I don't subscribe to that at all. <laughs> I think that's completely bonkers and makes no sense. If you had technology of, of, of this sophistication where you could alter reality, <laughs> you would not. Oh, well, maybe you would. I don't think you would go and erase a movie from existence. I, I just don't think that would happen. <laughs> okay, just, anyway, that's my opinion. Um, now, this is remarkably implausible to given the number of people and organizations involved in making and distributing a movie who would need to be sworn to secrecy into various private and public records which would need to be altered or destroyed to effectively erase all trace of it. I agree with that statement. It would also be spectacularly Orwellian uh, uh, to conceive, sorry, to convince the public that a commercial film which was uh, previously widely available had never actually existed. And again, why I go to some bizarre lengths for a lousy movie to uh, um, uh, about a genie granting wishes, you know? Why would you? Why would you make that disappear? Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. 
uh, having said that, though, there's some very interesting movies that were made recently. Uh, the um, I think it's the Bureau. What was it called? The Adjustment Bureau. That's right, with Matt Damon. Um, I, I highly recommend you guys watching that movie, The Adjustment Bureau, and then uh, Nowhere Man. It's a TV show of the 90s. Nowhere Man, one word. Um, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, it. It deals exactly with that kind of thing where an organization is actually erasing this man's existence. And then in the, by the end of the show, you, you actually question the entire premise of the show and, and this, this, this particular uh, protagonist's existence, in fact. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's actually one of, the, one of the shows that I enjoyed the most. Um, okay, I got a question here from the chat room. Um, yes, absolutely. So the question is, uh, could the Philadelphia Experiment and Project Montauk be the cause of the apparent rips in time that the Mandela effect uh, exposes? Uh, the answer is, um, yeah, I, I think so. Now, it's interesting to, to uh, also uh, take this in the, concept, uh, in the context of the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. Because this, this Mandela effect phenomenon started in 2010. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but it is quite possible that the Philadelphia experiment and Project Montauk could have created these rips in time and between dimensions, quite possibly, that are now leading to, to very bizarre and strange um, uh, uh, phenomena. And yes, uh, again, uh, this is from WD and Irish in the chat room. The winners write the history. So, like that, that's true as well, right? Uh, the, the winners write history, and it's possible to go back. If, if it is possible to go back in time to change your timeline, to change the dimensional constructs and, and uh, cohesion, then you could rewrite uh, history or your timeline any which way you want it. So, look, it, in my opinion, yes, absolutely. Whenever you, whenever you are dealing with something new, uh, like Tesla did, for example, even. Um, uh, the Nazi uh, Nazi Bell project, or or, uh, or the Philadelphia experiment, or or other similar experiments that we don't really know about, <clears throat> then we we always have to realize that we don't know what's going to happen. We we just don't know what the consequences are. Did the um, detonation of the uh, of the atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki cause some kind of rifts? Or, or did it, you know, uh, did it uh, destroy localized areas of space-time? Um, maybe. I mean, the energies released were staggering, right? I mean, whenever we do this, you know, release these, these staggering amounts of energy in in whatever we do with it, then yes. I mean, ask yourself this, guys: Why are we still conducting nuclear tests? Why? I understand it. Why a new nation like, I mean, Syria, I get it, you know, and, and, and even North Korea, I understand because they've never had nuclear weapons, so you have to. Um, so you have to, uh, um, you know, let them test it. You know, I mean, not that I want them to test it, but I understand why they do it. I get it because they haven't had one before. They don't know if it's going to work, so they're testing it. What I don't understand is why we continuously test nuclear weapons underground in the Pacific, all you know, all these things uh, f by nations that already have them. Why are we doing that? Is it <clears throat> that these tests? I mean, this is look, again completely tin for head guys right i'm just thinking out loud is it because the release of those energies does in fact open up portals in space time to to enable us to travel in time or to travel interdimensionally is is that the case is that why they're still doing it i, I don't know i don't know uh, but it it just um, it just uh, uh, boggles the mind as to why we still need these uh, uh, tests of nuclear devices Right. If somebody has got an explanation for me, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Why do we still conduct nuclear tests? <clears throat> now, uh, uh, having said that, though, there's a much larger uh, collider meant to come online very soon. Uh, much, I think, twice as large or as, as the existing Haldron Collider. And we'll see what happens with that. Right? Um, in fact, when the first uh, atomic bombs were detonated in modern times, people thought uh, the atmosphere might catch on fire. That was one of the concerns. It was a fairly rational concern because we just don't know we simply don't know if, if it could or it couldn't you know um we had never done it before in living memory now i contend that we have used uh, atomic and nuclear weapons in the past um and and uh, and a long time ago in fact very long time ago we have got some uh, myths that speak to that especially in the indian epics the harbor art especially right anyway i'm uh, slightly straying off path here so let's talk about what else the um 
um, critics or the rationalists tell us. A false memory. False memory. A false memory is the psychological phenomenon wherein a person recalls something that did not happen. False memories are often considered in legal cases regarding childhood sexual abuse. This phenomenon was initially investigated by psychological pioneers Pierre Janet and Sigmund Freud. Freud wrote The Etiology of Hysteria, where he discussed repressed memories of childhood sexual trauma in their relation to hysteria. Elizabeth Loftus has, since her debuting research uh, project in 1974, been a lead researcher in uh, memory recovery and false memories. False memory syndrome recognizes false memory as a prevalent part of one's life in which it affects the person's mentality and day-to-day -day life. False memory syndrome differs from false memory in that the syndrome is heavily influential in the orientation of a person's life, while false memory can occur without this significant effect. The syndrome takes effect because the person believes the influential memory to be true. So, but what it says here is essentially, Everybody has false memories, but it doesn't really matter because they don't change the way you live your life. But if you have false memory syndrome, then it does change your life because you believe that false memory to be true, but, you know, and, and it affects your life in a significant way. However, <clears throat> uh, its, research, its, its research is controversial and the syndrome is excluded from identification as a mental disorder and therefore is also excluded from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. False memory is an important part of psychological research because of the ties it has to a large number of mental disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Now another component part of false memory is collective false memories. False memories are sometimes shared by multiple people. For example, a somewhat common report of false memory is that uh, the name of the Berenstain Bears was once spelled Berenstain. Another reported example of uh, our false memories of a movie starring comedian Sinbad called Shazam. One study examined people who were familiar with the clock at Bologna Central Railway Station, which had been damaged in the Bologna massacre of 1980. In the study, 92% falsely remembered that the clock had been stopped by the bombing and did not recall that the clock had been repaired after the attack. In fact, the attack, sorry, in fact, the clock continued to operate and was only stopped 16 years later as a symbolic commemoration. In 2015, this phenomenon of collective false memory was the Mandela effect by self-described paranormal consultant Fiona Broom. Now, we've just learned this actually 2010, not 2015. Anyway, in reference to a false memory, she reports of the death of South African activist and later president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, in the 1980s, rather than on December 5, 2013, which she claims is shared by perhaps thousands of other people. Uh, okay, Broom has speculated about alternative realities as an explanation, but most commentators suggest that these are instead examples of false memories shaped by similar factors affecting multiple people, such as social reinforcement of incorrect memories or false news reports and misleading photographs influencing the formation of memories based on them. It's possible. Of course it is possible. Right? But it is also possible that they are in fact uh, real memories just from a different place, right? This, this reality we're living is, is, is much more mysterious than we have uh, even begun to understand. That's, that's really, really interesting. Um, look, uh, there's another, okay, another, go. yeah, there's another comment from the chat room. Sorry, guys, uh, this is around El Bilek, uh, also speaks of people remembering the Nazis winning World War II. Well, look, um, since we're on that for just for a second, it's digressing here. Uh, the Nazis the, on Nazi Germany uh, was, was uh, all set to win World War II. There are a couple of uh, critical failures uh, that can be attributed to it losing the war. One was, of course, uh, opening two fronts and, and uh, still having troops in, in Russia in winter, uh, something that nobody survives, including Napoleon. Um, and sorry, my esteemed partner is just mentioning me. There we go. There we go. I'm going to pull Dave in now, so just bear with me. So, so there are a couple of critical uh, um, failures. So that, that was one. The other one was the um, uh, entrance of the United States into World War II as well. Now, the Russians had already turned the tide after Stalingrad, but uh, certainly bringing the Americans in uh, helped a lot. <laughs> it really did. So... 
Um, these are two things. Now, could you go back and uh, and engineer that? I, I guess you could. I guess you could if you had the means. And now I, I'm trying to pull Dave in, but he's offline. Dave, if you if you can hear me, if if you can hear me, uh, I can't see you. Uh, I'm gonna try to. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Dave. Uh, you seem to be offline as far. Let's see if we can add you here. No, I can't add you here. Can. Second. Uh, but yeah, so so there are critical times that could possibly be used to change uh, our flow of events if you wanted to. If you had the means to go back in time, what what is the minimum effort? What is the minimum effort for you to uh, uh, undertake to actually, you know, change history? What is the minimum thing you have to do? I mean, killing Hitler, I don't think would change anything, right? It's, it's because there was a whole machine already put in place around. Uh, the war, so that that would do the trick. So you have to find other linchpins, other points where you can change it, and and that's the thing, right? The the, the, the thing is, if you've uh, this this recent show, I think I mentioned last time, based on one of Philip K. Dick's book, uh, The Man in the High Castle, which explores exactly that. It explores the possibility of other realities, okay, and other um, uh, other uh, um, dimensions, if you will, and people can can travel at will between them. It seems. Right. So it's it's interesting that uh, there we go. I've tried to add you, Dave. Uh, clearly, you're not coming in. Oh, in a second, let me try to add you here. One second. Sorry, bear with me, guys. So I'm trying to uh, add Dave into the conversation. Here we go. Add. Yeah, we should get him now. Okay, good. So yes, I think it's possible. I think it's possible uh, that we remember. Some of these things, and they were changed. Here we are. I think I've got Dave coming in. Joining hey, me. there we go. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Buddy. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, no, no. I, like I said, with the new uh, Skype, even if you drop out, I keep the station. It's very strange. Uh, I, I mean, it's good, I guess. <laughs> but uh, anybody on, on on the call now seems to be able to keep the station, even if the other person is is out. Now uh, we're just uh, talking about the glitch. It's in your memory, not the matrix. Um, a, a leading psych. Psychological theory holds that memory is constructive, not reproductive. That means the brain builds memories out of various bits and pieces of information on the fly, as opposed to playing them back like a recording. I don't know if that is true, because you've got people with eidetic memory, meaning they've got perfect memory. So for mm -hmm. them, it is a comp it's not just a recording, Dave. It is, it's like it's a photograph and, and a videotape and everything, right? So Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we should look at... Uh, people with that kind of memory and, and and to understand our memory <clears throat> because I don't think it is reproductive sorry I don't think it's constructive at all I don't so what what that means though they're saying here memories are impure they can be distorted by any number of factors including uh, bias association imagination and peer pressure so the answer is yes we do remember things subjectively to some extent I agree with that right I mean, how did it make you feel, you know, and then and how, what was your emotional state? All these wonderful things, because a memory is not just raw information. Oh, it was a sunny day. But what goes with it, it was a beautiful day. I went to the zoo. There was the sun on my face. I had a good time. I felt great. So that's the memory that you have, the totality of the experience, right? It's the totality of your subjective experience. It doesn't take away from the facts of the experience. It just adds more things to it. So I, I, I sorry, so, but because people have, Perfect memory in the world, right? They, they do have it. I have to disagree with the constructive uh, uh, hypothesis. But getting back to the Berenstain versus Berenstein quandary, one explanation <coughs> for the variant spelling is that names ending in stain are far more common than those ending in stain. Therefore, people's, re people's recollections are distorted by prior associations and expectations. Now, huh, that's fair to say. It's fair to say, but it doesn't take away from the fact that the other thing may be true also. Now, but why do some people remember Nelson Mandela dying 30 years before he did? Perhaps it's simply a case of two isolated bits of knowledge, that Nelson Mandela spent a long time in prison and that he's dead, being pieced together into a false memory in the absence of an actual recollection of the announcement of his death. Now, see, that's the thing, though. A lot of people have very clear and distinct memories of this happening, including, you know, uh, funerals, riots in the city. So there's, there's a whole... Unless we're saying that these people are so imaginative 
that they have just created this 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 whole other subset of of memories related to the false memory, right? I mean, yeah, you have to do more and more and more in order to justify um, these these uh, false memories and moving away from Occam's razor. In this case, again, see, Occam's razor depends on what you perceive reality to be, Dave. Occam's razor. So, what what is the baseline for the simplest explanation? Mm -hmm. Is the right one. Now, the simplest explanation in my mind here is that well, it's it's a memory, and they shift the dimension. That's that's me though. That's that's where I come from. For everybody else who's listening to the expert, clearly, the uh, the answer is oh no no, it's a false memory, and all the other stuff, all the other fluff that just built on it is is you know it's so it, it's it's self consistent. Um, it completely depends. It completely depends. What your starting point is. That's what it depends on. You know, I mean, how you how you take any of this information. That's why a lot of people dismiss it because we have been told to dismiss it, Dave. We have been told to ignore these things, right? Now, the final thing that the um, critics have to say here is memory is fallible. Have we said this enough? The list of psychological and social factors that can disrupt and distort recollection is very long indeed. It's to these we should look first for an explanation of the Mandela effect, which, which again would, of course, um, call up on Occam's razor. Um, okay, okay, but if they don't pan out, where else do we look after that, Dave? <laughs> no, I mean, you know. No, I, I, I get it. Yeah. That is so funny. I'm, I'm familiar with how memory can be changed. Mm -hmm. while it's stored away yep. and that an expectation that you might have of it because someone else's testimony this happens mm -hmm. in court a lot and that's why you should always if you've experienced something write it all down and you can refer to it later mm -hmm. you can reread it later because yeah. the sooner you write it down the less changed it is yeah. and in court that's extremely important and you know if if they find that you're giving a different account to your original testimony then you're going to get into some serious strife that's from a legal perspective that i'm looking at that from and that that can mean the beginning or the end if you're giving a statement or it could be detrimental to the person that you may be attempting to um, uh, give testimony on behalf of or against, it depends. Yep. All right. So, yes, memory can be altered, but not collectively across an entire, you know, I'm only just throwing these percentages out. But say it was a third, just that, let's pretend a third of all the people on the planet thought that was around at the time that watched the media, lots of ifs there, that believed mm -hmm. that they'd heard that Mandela had, had died. And another mm -hmm. third had heard that he didn't or just didn't hear that he died. And then we all later discovered that he was alive and well. <laughs> and and there was another third of the people who were around at the time that didn't understand either of those things. Didn't even know who he was. Who cares? Absolutely. So how could a whole third of people have the same memory of the but same even, events? Even if it isn't a third, right? For argument's sake, even yeah. if it's one percent, I'm just saying. Even, even if it's a percent of a percent, it, it is yep. still something that that we need to look at because I mean. I don't think there's necessarily people falling through dimensional rifts and mass. I don't think it's like a huge exodus from one dimension to another. I think, in fact, I think it's more of like an exchange thing. So in this universe here, we're talking about this, and somewhere else they talk about something else, because people obviously they're being transplaced, or maybe maybe it's just your mind that moves. Maybe when you dream, maybe when you dream, you just you just uh, uh, lose your way and you go to a different. Uh, uh, dimension. Do you know what I mean? Like so, so, so maybe you get lost on the way. I mean, who knows? I, I, you know, or you get, you're going home. You know, when you live in 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 a, in a street where every house looks the same. I mean, like I'm talking mm -hmm. about a like hundred houses, they all look the same. I've seen them. It's, it's very depressing. But let's say that's where you live. But there are no house numbers, right? And, and you only know roughly uh, which which one yours is. Especially let's let's say it's dark and you had a few minutes to drink, uh, a few too many to drink, and you're walking down the street, and they all have the same lock. So they all have this like every key fits every lock. 
So you, you stumble into a house. It looks exactly like your house, but you go in. But there's there's a there's a picture of of, of uh, the peanuts uh, over the fridge, and there's a there's a white screen TV instead of a CRT in your lounge, right? But that's the difference. There's not everything else in the house is the same. And you go, oh, okay, that's uh, I guess uh, this is my house, but I must have misremembered what I have here. So that's that's probably what this is like. Like I said earlier, I think these dimensional things, or these dimensions as as, as we perceive them, are very close to each other, and and meaning that uh, they're very similar. In fact, it makes sense, uh, Dave. As with our listeners, my thought here, it makes sense. Very game and and completely uh, unimportant things are different. Like the movie Shazam, who cares if the movie was made or not? You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. But it would be the kind of thing. It makes sense if you fell into another dimension that you would be remembering to be different. I mean, there might be a million other things that you don't remember to be different, but this one thing makes sense, right? Mackie, this, this can makes, I? Go ahead. Can I bring can I bring up that lady that lived in South America? Yeah, 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 definitely. All right, because I think that's the right time to bring it up now, right? Hmm. We've only got a few minutes before the end, the top of the show, the end of the show, and and I want people to remember something until the next show, uh, until show number two fifty eight. Now, there was a lady who woke up, went to work, and when she got to work. She went to her office, and on the door was a different name. Yes, and she became she became confused. Yes, and she when she asked a few people, she, they said, "Oh no, no, you work down here with the rest of us." Oh right, she thought maybe there was a restructure, or you know, they'd uh, jostled some people about in the office to make some more room. For, who knows? It happens. But no, she wasn't the manager today. She was one of the people who reported to a different person in her in the role she used to be in. She got confused. It wasn't her office. She was she wasn't doing the job that she had been doing the previous day. They she'd never done that job, although she woke up, and there it was, it, a different reality. She went home. Mackie, is this right? She went, I think it might be in the show notes anyway. It is actually, yes. <laughs> but yes, go on. But she went home, and this is it. This is important for that dimension traveling, dimension jumping, different memory. Because if only a small proportion of your prior history is changed, that makes sense as the Mandela effect. If only it was significant enough to be something that may not even ever have ever been mentioned for the rest of your life, but it just happened to be. Then it came up, and since 2012, here we go. We're on this weird mix of realities. Yeah. Because if it if it was significant enough, like this poor lady who, you know, she got home and her husband wasn't even there, and. Did she have a different car or something as well? Yes. She went to the really? house and it wasn't her house anymore. Yeah. And, you know, her husband wasn't. All these different things. Now, if if the timeline changed or she jumped tracks and she wasn't, it wasn't significant, she wouldn't have known. Maybe this happened to, to all of these people. Maybe it happened to you. Maybe it happened to me, Mackie. We don't know. But it's not enough of a change to have affected our lives only in that it happened to him, to Nelson Mandela. Maybe he did die. Maybe he didn't. Maybe this is, maybe they resurrected Nelson Mandela in some way, shape or form so he could go on and do his job, whatever that was to be. Yep. Yep. That's what the mystery of this whole thing is because there's been evidence, so you can think about this, in history where people have just appeared out of thin air and not only appeared out of th I mean I mean really appeared out of thin air there's the music and that's it guys <laughs> do, do come back next week uh, when, when we are continuing on our exploration of the Mandela effect do donate if you can please but uh, thank you Dave and I hope your computer has rebooted by now <laughs> it, it only just now has finished and, and hang on uh, to the station. Keep listening because Gia Bear has a roundtable coming up next. And you 
call in. Call in and become part of the radio. Take care. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio.